Good evening. Today is my distinct pleasure and privilege to interview one of my mentors, someone who learned, taught me a lot throughout the years. Dr. Colin Campbell is joining us from Ireland. Dr. Colin Campbell, petroleum geologist from Oxford, a world-renowned oil expert. He's also the founder of ASPO International. ASPO International is an organization worldwide that was founded by Dr. Colin Campbell and many thinkers, scholars, politicians get together to discuss one of the most critical issues of our time, the peak oil. With that introduction, we have Dr. Colin on the line. Dr. Colin, welcome to the show. Good evening. Uh, Dr. Campbell, you, your presentation, you titled it as Turning Point for Mankind. What do you mean by that? Well, I think that the the whole industrial world we've known for the last 200 years was largely built on cheap energy from oil and gas, which has grown in, in magnitude over the last century. And now it heads into decline. This is a fundamental turning point for mankind, I would say. A fundamental turning point for mankind. And today we will ask you questions to expand on that for our audience. But I want to start the show with something fun. I, I came across one of your pictures that, uh, and here you are, sitting on a horse. You're not on a helicopter. This is back in the 60s. Would you tell our audience what are you doing on that horse back then? Well, I was a field geologist working in, in Colombia for an oil company. And in those distant days, we did exploration on horseback, as you could see. And we had very simple technology, just the, the hammer, the hand lens, and a notebook. But although technology has advanced enormously since those days, I think we're still dealing with the same old rocks. And that is a critical point, because it is the rocks that determine how much oil there is. All right, Dr. Campbell, I want to go right to the issue many of our viewers are watching with a great deal of concern. What's unraveling in North Africa? What's unraveling in Middle East? And one of the fundamental questions is that, as it relates to oil, what is going to happen to the oil supply? And as we see Brent uh, in excess of $110, we see West Texas Intermediate somewhere in mid-90s. So the question becomes, would Saudi Arabia, as a swing producer, which seems to have always been there. Are they going to be around to do it? And in that regard, we see the oil minister from Saudi Arabia, Al Naimi, he says that we have 4 million a day excess production. Yet again, we see from the WikiLeaks cables that sometime in 2007, the ambassador, United States ambassador to Saudi Arabia, after talking to Saddam al Husseini, he discovers that actually the Saudis don't have the kind of reserve they're talking about. And of course, many scholars do understand that you said that back in 1998. So is there a capacity of production that we could rely on Saudis? Well, it's an impossible question to answer. Really. No, nobody knows precisely what the oil situation in uh, Saudi Arabia and, and the other OPEC countries is. They, they have, the, the OPEC quota was based on how much reserves you reported, and that gave a big incentive for the countries there to exaggerate how much they had to get more quota. And there was a kind of competition between the different countries to, to claim more reserves in order to get more reserves. More, more quota, I mean. But the situation is extremely obscure, and nobody knows, and you get these conflicting <laughs> Uh, pictures from what the government reports and what the insiders say. My own view is that they have rather less than they're claiming. Now, uh, the numbers that uh, you were graciously provided to us uh, tell a story. There are some blue numbers on the screen as we're talking, viewing this thing. There are some red numbers and there are some green numbers. Could you explain what these mean? Yes, I, I'll explain this background of OPEC reserve reporting. In, in 1970, Kuwait reported 67, shown in blue here. And the number fell to 64 by 1984, because naturally they were producing the oil and the reserves fell. 
And in the 80s, there was low oil price. The OPEC countries were under some pressure. There was new production from offshore and so on. And suddenly, overnight, Kuwait announced a 50% increase from 64 to 90. Nothing had happened in the oil fields. Nothing had changed. It was simply in the reporting. Okay, well, nobody exactly knows what this new number meant, but it seems very suspicious. Then in 1987, they had a small increase to 92, which might have been a genuine new discovery of 2 billion barrels. But it just blew the fuse for the other OPEC countries, and Ab because they were losing quota as a result. And so Abu Dhabi said, well, if you're 92, so are we, up from 31. Iran went by one better at 93, up from 49. And Saddam Hussein in Iraq, he capped them both at 100, up from 47. And Venezuela, in the other side of the ocean, jumped from 25 to 56, and it did so in that case because it started including all this heavy oil that had not been counted before. Now, the Saudis were in a problem because they couldn't match Kuwait because they were already reporting more. So they did it for another couple of years, and then in 90, 1990, announced a massive increase from 167 to 258. And um, it is quite obvious, looking at these numbers, that they are unreliable. I mean, it's looking at Abu Dhabi, for example, it's absurd to think that they've reported the same number from 1998 until uh, 1990 and long afterwards at 92 because reserves don't stay the same unless they're exactly matched by production. So the numbers are grossly unreliable. Nobody knows exactly what the true numbers are. But the, the numbers at the bottom there is at least my best guess as to what the reality is. To summarize this picture, this is a very profound picture. These numbers do talk to us. I will summarize what we have here. Abu Dhabi says 98 billion, you're saying 50, Iran 150, you're saying 73. Look at Iraq 140, in excess of that, you're estimating 70. Looking at Kuwait at 100 and plus, you are 56. Saudis, the biggest reserve that we rely so much on, 262 billion, yet your estimation is still 176. We go to Venezuela, 211 down to 20. This is a fundamental difference where scholars such as yourself look at real numbers, but the published data are what it is, what they are at the various levels. So the key question it becomes is that, uh, in your opinion, first of all, with this political situation that we have, are Saudis going to potentially be next with the turmoil that we see? It's, it's, no one can predict the, the outcome of the, the future turmoil in the Middle East. But I think we can say with quite uh, a degree of assurance now that in Libya, at least, Whatever political situation unfolds, the production is going to fall over the next few months. It's impossible they can maintain production in this situation, whatever it might be. And that's a very serious thing because I don't think that any of the other countries really have enough capacity to match the fall in, in Kuwait. And, of course, if the problem should spread to Algeria and then uh, Bahrain and to eventually perhaps even Saudi Arabia itself, well, then we face a really serious question. In, in, as things unravel, yet again the number comes to mind where some four million a day surplus production is claimed by uh, Saudis. Uh, in your assessment, is that an accurate number? And if it's not, what would be the likely number, as you would see, that they could potentially produce if need be? Well, the, the question facing the Sauds is, is what they should do, because I, I have an impression that uh, King Abdullah himself comes to understand this situation, and he recently said that he wished to leave more wealth in the ground for his sons and his grandsons. So Saudi Arabia has absolutely no motive to increase production 
And in te- strictly technical terms, it probably could for a few years, but it has no motive to do so. It has every good reason to try to hold production at the present level to make it last a little bit longer and delay the onset of the inevitable decline that they themselves come to understand. So I don't, they might have a little bit of spare capacity to add, but it makes very little sense for them to actually add it. Um, simply to get rid of their wealth a little bit quicker makes no sense. And, and furthermore, the higher oil prices that will result from the shortage brings them uh, more income. So they have absolutely no motive to increase production, save to the degree they're under pressure from, from the United States and other countries, which may be one of the elements involved. So if they were to, uh, as you would probably term it, uh, do the, the prudent way of uh, production, in other words, without damaging the reservoir, in your, in your assessment, the four million is over-exaggerated in terms of what their ability is without really damaging uh, the, the fundamental in the reservoir. Yes, well, there's two elements. There's the question of overproducing the fields, and that's a technical question, and I'm sure they won't do that. But even if they had ordinary spare capacity to add at, at will, they have no, I mean, they've got to think of their own future, their sons and grandsons, and so they don't want to blow it all away in the next few years, and they would like to keep a little bit for the future. Yes. Makes eminent good sense. Yes, okay. The Saudi uh, King Abdullah appears for the past week or so to wanting to actually uh, spend himself uh, out of the, t- the turmoil by uh, some $37 billion in aid uh, in various sectors of uh, the society. Um, what do you think the, again, I understand you're a petroleum geologist, but your perspective is uh, well respected in terms of what do you think that the stability of Saudis uh, could be rattled, and if it is, given the critical position of Saudis and the United States dependence on Saudis, what do you think possibly could, uh, could be the end result? Well, I think the situation has been that, that uh, these governments throughout that region are fairly artificial and uh, sort of strange governments by all means, but they lived on the back of this enormous oil wealth that poured in. And so um, um, uh, everything worked more or less all right, but um, in the last few years we've had this surge in oil price because we reached the peak of, of regular conventional oil and the price of oil went up and in turn that meant that the price of food went up through the ceiling. That meant that the cost of living for the ordinary people in the streets of these countries doubled or got worse and they felt deeply resentful and started revolting against their governments, and one can understand their reaction. Now, in the case of uh, King Saud, he's, he's trying to solve that problem by all sorts of handouts to try to ameliorate the problem his people face. So that's sort of their reaction to it. Now, if we potentially, if we see uh, the turmoil spread to Saudis, what is your assessment in terms of how would the United States and the West would react uh, in one hand if, if these things uh, spreads out in Saudis? We're talking a significant six or seven million barrel of production not coming online, which could be devastating uh, for the Western interest. On the other side, uh, there is a spread of democracy and whatnot. What do you think is likelihood of, of uh, that happening? Well, it's a very difficult question to answer. I mean, I, I think that the West uh, has been very slow to come to terms with the reality of peak oil. Sure, there's a great argument going on, whether it's this year, last year, next year, ten years out, who knows? It's, the numbers are not uh, accurate enough to be dogmatic about it. But what is and more important than the peak of production itself is the vision of the long decline on the other side of it. Yes. So I think the Western governments, if they were well advised, would face up to this situation and start 
planning for this decline in production, whether it comes this year or in a few years out, makes no real difference. But if they go the other way and try to live in the past, so to speak, and say, well, okay, with Saudi, if we want your oil, we're going to come and take it by military force, that, that doesn't really solve the overall problem. It might be a short-term solution, but the longer-term issue is imposed by nature and is not really a Middle East issue.